itself. The 1990s really we see the clash of the monarchy and the media. The tabloid newspapers were, you know, absolutely full of stories of the relationship breakdowns of Charles and Diana, Fergie and Andrew, the divorce of Princess Anne. It was all there. And this was really when the royal family imploded. And from being an asset, suddenly the royal family became toxic. toxic. 1992 was a year of crisis for the royal family. An intimate book was published about Diana's marriage to Charles. And then a fire broke out at the Queen's favourite home, Windsor Castle. It later cost £36 million to repair. And after public resistance to footing the bill, the Queen started to pay income tax for the first time. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. When Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris, criticism of the royal family fell on the Queen herself. She had received the news at Balmoral. The family set off for church as usual that Sunday morning. But at the service, there was no mention of Diana. At Buckingham Palace, in accordance with protocol, no flag flew at half-mast. The Queen was not in residence. She remained in Scotland with her bereaved grandchildren, provoking strong criticism. It was a difficult decision for them and, uh, as to how to handle it. The immediate thought was how do we protect these two young boys that have just lost their mother? And um, the immediate instinct, and I, get, I think this is a very human thing, is to circle the wagons and look after those boys. And I think that was the instinct of the Queen, uh, Prince Philip, Prince Charles and all the family up at Balmoral. Under pressure to act and on advice from the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, the Queen returned to London and on the eve of the funeral gave the public what they wanted, a personal expression of grief. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. A few months later, the Queen and Prince Philip celebrated their golden wedding anniversary, and after a tough year, both uncharacteristically spoke openly about their lives together. Philip gave a rare insight into the qualities that made their royal marriage a happy union. Of course, after 50 years of experience, I find there's a great temptation to give advice. <laughs> <clears throat> the trouble is that no two marriages are quite alike. However, I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. In 2002, the Queen lost her only sibling, Princess Margaret. And then, just seven weeks later, her mother. But despite the sadness, it was also a landmark year for the Queen, as 2002 marked her golden jubilee, 50 years on the throne. The combination of events led to an upsurge in support for the monarchy. The affection for her at an all-time high, when she became the unexpected star of the opening ceremony of the 2012 London Olympics. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty.
After initially opposing Charles marrying Camilla Parker Bowles, the Queen eventually came round to the idea. It was a symbolic moment for the royal family, a time of reconciliation and forgiveness. The weddings of the Queen's grandsons seem to herald a more open and younger looking monarchy. When Prince William married Kate Middleton from outside the aristocracy, and then when Harry married Meghan Markle, these were some of the most watched events ever. Meghan and Harry, it was going to be this great moment for the royal family in which the royal family was going to change, really revolutionary, and reflect really the multicultural society of Britain. And yet it didn't work out that way. Meghan blamed the brutal treatment she was given by the British tabloids and lack of support from the royal family for her and Prince Harry's decision to step away from royal duties. The Queen herself was forced to intervene to remove Prince Andrew from his public roles as the scandal that had started with his friendship with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein grew. Sir. Sir. Turbulent times for the House of Windsor just as Prince Philip, described by the Queen as her rock, was becoming ever more frail. I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. 2020 brought the biggest global crisis of her long reign. Over 150,000 people in the UK died with coronavirus. People locked down at home to avoid spreading infection. I want to thank everyone on the NHS frontline, as well as care workers and those carrying out essential roles who selflessly continue their day-to-day -day duties outside the home in support of us all. Just as she'd done 80 years before, she addressed the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will...